Hello and welcome to Framingham Now. I'm Jack Patrick Lewis, state representative for the town of Ashland and one of the reps right here in Framingham. We have a special show today. Uh, as many of you know, Rep Chris Walsh passed a couple months ago and while we continue to mourn our loss uh, and celebrate all of the contributions he made to Framingham and our greater commonwealth, his district needs representation and the race to continue his hard work is already underway. And today I'm interviewing one of the candidates running for that seat. Maria Robinson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Representative Lewis. I appreciate it. Representative Lewis, no one calls me that. <laughs> My kids call me Jack, so you're required to call me Jack as well. All right. Uh, so Maria, why are you running? I'm running because I love Framingham so much. We have moved here about six years ago. My husband and I were looking at where we want to settle our family. Um, we made spreadsheets because we're engineers and that's what engineers do. And Framingham came out on top, hands down. It had everything that we possibly wanted. And since then we moved in our two foster children. And then most recently last year, my parents moved in with us uh, from Pennsylvania as well. So I plan on living here for a very long time. I'm extremely invested in our community. And I wanna make sure that our community continues to grow. We were at an interesting crossroads as we become a city. Um, and I want to take my experience working with state legislatures and bring it to the state house in order to fight for Framingham. Excellent. Let's jump right in with a question that you know maybe not everyone likes to talk about around the dinner table, but taxes. Uh, one of the proposals the legislature was working on this year was tweaking the income tax in order to ensure that there was greater revenue for transportation and education. And I was curious your opinion on that. Absolutely. I was a big fan of the fair share amendment and the work that everyone has been doing in order to ensure that there is enough revenue. It was so fascinating because uh, this was the so-called millionaire's tax. And when it pulled with millionaires, they were the ones most supportive of it because they wanted to make sure that they were giving back to their communities in a way that was fair across the board. And we need that revenue in order to continue to support additional English language learning students, special education needs, and then obviously there's a large number of transportation uh, and infrastructure investments that we could be making with that. So I know that the legislature is looking into potentially passing something outside of the ballot measure that was struck down by the Supreme Judicial Court, and I'd love to be part of a delegation that supports that in the future. Excellent. As I remember, it was going to uh, create an additional 4% tax on incomes over a million dollars and the proposal would have brought uh, two billion dollars into the state budget specifically for education and transportation and while it's not going to be on the ballot this November I'm confident that uh, whoever is in this seat uh, next year will have the opportunity to either work for it or work against it so absolutely it's nice to see opportunities for us to move towards a progressive tax structure and away from a regressive one uh, here in Massachusetts. Excellent, I couldn't agree more. Uh, continuing that same conversation, welfare benefits barely make up a third of the federal level, uh, which is simply unsustainable to so many families, especially families living in our own community. What would you do to specifically help families uh, that rely on some of these benefits that are looking to be provided support so they can uh, provide for their family, uh, pursue new employment, uh, and do what all of us do as parents, want to take care of their families. Absolutely. And so one in eight families in Massachusetts receive some type of welfare benefits. So we're not talking about just certain parts of the population. Chances are you probably know someone who does receive these benefits and there are hardworking people who deserve to be able to not have to choose between paying health bills or putting food on the table. Um, one of the things that the legislature did this year was um, pass a pathway to a $15 minimum wage. I think what we need to continue to do is make sure that that minimum wage increases with inflation. I know we spent, um, there, there was a lot of activity of getting to this pathway to 15, but it doesn't stop there. Um, another area would be for the SNAP benefits, the, the food benefits. There are suggestions of increasing the number of restrictions on locations and types of food that you can purchase with those. And I think we need to actually roll back some of those restrictions. It's making it more difficult. Um, people need to be able to choose healthy options. I know there's some conversation around changing whether farmers markets can accept those benefits. And I think um, having access to fresh fruit and vegetable is incredibly important. We need to continue to provide free lunch for students who need it um, and make sure that that is a healthy option because sometimes that's the only meal that our students receive. And then 
one other area that I know that our superintendent agrees with is universal pre-K. Um, the cost of childcare is outrageous, <laughs> um, as uh, we both know as parents. And by providing another educational pathway a year earlier, it reduces the burden on families as well as increases the ability for those students who might uh, be underprivileged to catch up earlier uh, with, with their peers and get those thousand books in before kindergarten starts. Excellent. And I think, as you know, uh, my family joined a couple of my colleagues and having uh, lived into the SNAP benefit challenge. And we only did it for five days, but it was a challenge by many of the larger food banks in the state to ask elected officials to try to live for food purposes just on what SNAP benefits provide. Uh, and I can tell you that going to the grocery store to purchase food for that week, the things that were on my mind were not the same things. I was constantly counting every penny, every dollar. Uh, as the kids advocated for things, we, there wasn't even a negotiation about what, what the uh, additional fun things could be in the cart. Uh, and it was an eye-opening, even though it was just a short five days. Uh, but it made me more uh, interested in advocating to ensure that the SNAP benefits are provided for families, but also, as you said, that we provide uh, avenues for fresh local produce at farmers markets, making sure that's available, <coughs> which I know local farmers markets have a, have a plan with the state to be able to do that and, and doing it successfully, uh, but something we need to always keep in mind. And if you're elected, you'll probably be invited to join the small group of us, a growing group of us, uh, doing the SNAP benefit challenge next year. And Absolutely, and I can't can't imagine what that shopping trip will mm. be like with my children. I'm sure they will be not excited, but hopefully learn a lot yes. in the process. <laughs> and your kids and my kids can, uh, can share notes. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> another question, it's 2018, but the gender pay, pay gap is still there. The racial pay gap continues to exist. It's 2018, it's Massachusetts, but this is a reality for so many folks uh, that work in our Commonwealth. As an elected official, what would you do to fight that? It's a real problem. So. I am a woman, may be obvious, um, and I have been on the side of gender pay gap issues in the past in my career, um, and I know that plenty of other people have as well. They say 70, 70, 77 cents to the dollar for women to men, but when you're also adding in race as a component, black women, Latino women make more like 50 cents to the dollar compared to their white male compatriots, and that's a problem. Um, I actually. Uh, was making a joke with someone recently that the state legislature is one of the places where it is equal pay mm. <laughs> across the board. But Boston has <coughs> been doing some very interesting um, pilot programs of trying to uh, help women negotiate their salaries. That's something that I'd like to see rolled out across the state. Um, that has been more focused on professional women and less on those um, more minimum wage workers, and we need to continue doing that. Um, but the other thing that is important to me, I think, is that we as a society need to continue to value uh, the kinds of careers that are predominantly women. Um, I'm thinking nurses, social workers, teachers, where they aren't necessarily receiving the types of pay or benefits that are commensurate with the amount of work that they're doing. And I would love to see, um, see us in a universe at some point in the future where those types of roles are as valued as uh, police officers or firefighters uh, in our community and making sure that they're receiving a, a fair wage. And so as they go into different uh, union negotiations, I would want to be involved with that and make sure that we continue to work towards an actual goal. I know that we have legislation mm -hmm. on the books, um, but legislation is part of it. The actual implementation is where it needs to happen. And sometimes even when we pass uh, wonderful uh, legislation that people have been working on for years, you have to pass follow-up legislation in order to ensure that it's actually followed through. Exactly. Uh, and I can imagine in the years ahead, uh, the pay equity legislation will need to be tweaked in order to ensure that uh, folks can't skirt around it. Most certainly. <coughs> I want to talk about an issue that I know very close to your heart, environmental issues. Uh, Massachusetts has set uh, some ambitious benchmarks uh, for reducing our own emissions, uh, ideally working within the region. Uh, but I'm curious, there needs to be so much more work. And we set these benchmarks. When I hear colleagues talking about 2040 and 2050, I, I can't even imagine those years. They seem so far away when even 2020 seems like it's, it's 
you know, decades down the road, even when it's not. Uh, what would you do as an elected official to ensure that we continue to be ambitious while at the same time uh, are doing what's necessary to meet these goals? So, yes, environmental issues, clean energy, that's what I've spent my entire career working on um, in state legislatures across the country, many of which are not as far along as Massachusetts, which is number one in energy efficiency in, in this country, which we're very proud of. But there's certainly more to be done in terms of curbing carbon emissions, particularly from the transportation sector. I think that's the next big thing. Um, the regional greenhouse gas initiative that you were mentioning, uh, applies to uh, power plants specifically, and we've done a great job of reducing the number of coal plants in, in New England uh, as a, a part of that. And I would certainly be part of a group of folks who would oppose any new gas pipelines, which is a large conversation happening at the federal level right now that New England needs more gas uh, in order to meet its electricity needs. And I think that there is a strong argument to be made that with additional offshore wind and additional renewable renewable energy and energy storage, that there won't be a need for that. Um, when we think of power plants, it really is a 30-year investment. So in order to get to that 2050 goal, we need to start thinking now about what kinds of plants that we want to invest in. So I think electric vehicle charging stations, making sure that those are easier to access, um, and it's not just uh, sort of a novelty uh, that, that we see in parking lots in downtown Boston, but turn that into a regular everyday thing, and making sure that there are some incentives for people to uh, switch over to electric vehicles uh, from the gas turbine engines. I want to continue that same conversation uh, with transportation. Uh, we live out in the you know, greater metro west area, so folks get to work, sometimes they drive across town, sometimes they get on the pike and they sit in traffic for an hour and a half. Uh, they often take the commuter rail into Boston, sometimes west or they use the regional transportation uh, that's available to them. I'm curious what you would do as an elected official to advocate for your constituents who take the variety of transportation available to them uh, while also wanting public transportation to be reliable. Sure, well first of all, I'd probably make you carpool. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'd look forward to that. Uh, but more importantly, First of all, the MWRTA, the regional transportation, needs to operate on Sundays. That's a real problem and adds to the number of cars on the road um, or means that uh, citizens aren't able to actually get to their jobs. Um, and now everybody works on Sundays now. Having the Sundays off is not an option for a lot of people, particularly who work in restaurants or retail. Um, so that is one major thing that I, I think needs to happen. Second, with the commuter rail, we need to figure out a schedule that actually works for people. Um, I know there's a lot of struggle with people who want to go in the middle of the day who may not be the typical nine to five commuters. I think that they are serviced reasonably well um, outside of parking, which we in Framingham at least have started to address uh, more significantly. Although I know lots of people do rely on the West Natick parking lot and that is difficult to find parking after about 6, 10 a.m. Um, so we need to continue to improve upon those in order to get people to use public transportation. The other thing is we need to make it easier for people who want to use bicycles. Um, my dream is to someday ride my bike to a commuter rail station and then take the commuter rail to, um, to the city. And right now, I live on Edgell Road. It is not the world's safest place to be riding a bicycle all the time, especially if you're not as confident on a bike uh, as I am not. Um, but I'd like to see some of our rail trails really connect to some of these larger commuter areas so that we can reduce the number of cars on the road. I think everybody can agree that we'd love to reduce the number of cars on the road. It's just finding a way to make it convenient for people and also um, affordable. I appreciate your offer of carpooling into work. I can tell you my interns and I do that on a regular basis and I love it because we can continue the conversation and exactly. when my staff person and I used to go to and from work together, it meant that we got to work an extra three hours each day together. Uh, you have kids that are in local Framingham public schools. That is correct, at Hemingway and Walsh. Excellent. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about education and your dreams for what we can do to continue to improve public education. So there's lots of things we can continue to do to improve public education. First of all, I think 
the work that you've done, and I want to say thank you very much for your advocacy on increasing funding specifically for English language learning students and special education students. That That is huge for Framingham. That makes up a massive amount of our budget. And I know in our schools, we're um, at Hemingway, we're in the process of hiring our first Portuguese-speaking teacher. I'm sure it will not be the last. And it is difficult to find some of these qualified teachers who can both meet our children's language needs, educational needs, and their social needs. I continue to say to my kids all the time, school is about 50% of what you learn in, in books and then 50% socially in learning to work with other people constructively. Um, and finding people who are incredibly qualified in all of those areas, in addition to speaking another language, it can, can be hard. And our district needs those teachers and we need to continue to find that. As I mentioned, universal pre-K is a, is a major priority Priority, um, I think that will alleviate some of the child care costs that we're all seeing in addition to providing a more level playing field um, for, for some of our students. So I'd love to see those things happen. Um, excited to see a new Fuller Middle School at some point in time uh, in the near future and want to make sure that, uh, that all of our buildings can last for a long time so that we can house however many students that we end up having. Uh, it seems that the number continues to grow. Uh, a question on education that might seem very, very specific, but mm -hmm. it's something that I've been working with my colleagues on. Uh, in Massachusetts, there isn't a requirement that if sex ed is taught, uh, that it be comprehensive, that it be up to date, that it be scientifically accurate. And so we've been working with uh, several statewide organizations on what's called the Healthy Youth Act uh, to ensure that if your school decides to teach sex ed, which Massachusetts law does not require, and if your parent does not opt you out of that sex ed, which law allows them, that the what you receive in health class is scientifically accurate, it's up to date, and inclusive. Uh, and I'm curious, as someone who might be a future colleague, would you be in support of that bill? Could I count you as a co-sponsor? Or yes, you can count me as a co-sponsor of that bill. This is really important, especially to LGBTQ plus youth, that they understand medically accurate sex ed. Um, and it, it helps to reduce the stigma um, or around sex as a concept, which I think is continually important as we face um, all of these Me Too scandals. I think increasing the amount of education that we're giving young people and helping them to better understand um, the act of sex mm -hmm. and the f the physical nature of it is incredibly important. So I, you can count me in. Oh, excellent. Sure. And you, you touched right on it, that we think of sex ed and we go right back to maybe our own memories of fifth grade, but health classes need to be more than just the naming of parts. It needs to be about consent. Mm -hmm. It needs to be uh, about uh, relationships and friendships and the complexity that is this. Uh, and. I want, you know, I have three kids. Uh, I want to make sure that when they go to school, what they learn at school complements what they learn at home. And I want to know that there are responsible adults, in addition to myself, uh, who are having these same conversations about consent. Uh, and they're not necessarily getting it from TV. They're not getting it from the movies. They're not getting it from YouTube. Uh, so the least we can do is get it from sure school. school. I agree. Uh, criminal justice is something we've worked on this year at the State House. And it was a big part of last year, uh, but it doesn't mean we're not going to be taking it up and tweaking the law in the years ahead. I'm curious your thoughts on our current criminal justice system and what can and should be done to improve it. Sure. I was very excited to see the reforms proposed, um, particularly by Senator Spilka, who I think was a driving force behind uh, the criminal justice reforms. And we've learned a lot since at least I was a kid in the late 80s, early 90s, where all crime was bad. And we're learning that people come from a variety of backgrounds and that there are a wide variety of crimes as well. And I think that's why we need to not apply a broad brush to all situations. And the one thing that um, this the law passed earlier this year addressed in part, but still could use some improvement on, is changing out mandatory minimums. Um, mandatory minimum sentences usually lead to increased reincarceration um, once people have left the criminal justice system, particularly as children. Um, and we're we're starting to see that um, you know we've known for years that this disproportionately impacts communities of color, and we need to revisit what mandatory minimums are actually trying to do and see if there is another pathway for actually achieving those same outcomes.
So Maria, I want to change gears and do yes. something we've never done uh, and switch to a, a new uh, component of the show that I'm going to call the lightning round, okay. where I'm going to ask a series of questions and as complicated as life is and as complicated as politics is, I'm looking for a yes or a no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Do I get struck by lightning if I answer incorrectly in the maybe, lightning round? Maybe not here at this table, but okay. maybe later. All we'll right. see. Time will tell. Uh, so yes or no, I know that's hard. And if we have time at the end, maybe I'll ask if you have a question you'd like to elaborate on, more on. Uh, but that'll be contingent on time. So if I ask, do you like dogs? Yes. Yes, good. You're, you're a good human being. Uh, not yes, but I really love bulldogs. See the difference there? Do you like ice cream? Yes. Yes, see, just yes, not yes. It was really hard not to say, of course. Of course, see. <laughs> So we're, we have a series of questions. I'm asking all the candidates the same questions. <coughs> in politics, I think a lot of things start with convictions. This is where I am. And a lot of those are yes or no questions. And then bills and language can be complicated and it can require compromise. Uh, but at the end, you're then presented with a bill where you're given the option of voting yes, voting no, or walking down the hall and just not voting. Uh, so in that same spirit, would you support requiring any company that receives tax credits in the Commonwealth to pay a living wage to their employees and provide good benefits to all of their employees? Yes. Excellent. Would you support creating a single payer health insurance system in Massachusetts that guarantees access, is publicly funded, and lowers the cost of health care? Yes. Would you support workers in struggles or picket lines fighting for better working conditions? Yes. Do you support the president's initiative to ban immigrants from certain countries from entering the United States? No. Do you support a woman's right to choose? Yes. Do you support the death penalty? No. Do you support allowing citizens to register and vote on election day? Yes. <coughs> Do you support, <coughs> I'm so sorry. Do you support the legislation that we passed earlier this year increasing the minimum wage to $15? Yes. We also recently banned conversion therapy for minors. Would you have voted yes? Yes. Uh, we also voted to create a paid family medical leave program, would you have voted yes? Yes. We also passed an extreme risk protection order earlier this year as it related to guns. Would you have voted in favor? Yes. And lastly, do you support the Safe Communities Act? Yes. Excellent. See that? No, no, lightning came out. Oh, it was, good. I kind of like it. I'm going to do more of those. Uh, <laughs> so looking at the time, I try to end every interview by asking the same question. Uh, people like yourself, you're running for elected office, which means you're putting yourself out there in a way that most people don't. Uh, you're going to concerts on the common, you're knocking on people's doors, you're waking up babies, you're kissing babies, you're interrupting dinner, you're being invited to dinner. Uh, your life is not your own anymore. And I <coughs> like to think that that's partially who you are and the other people running are as people, but that there's also something about this city that we live in, Framingham, that makes it the kind of place that you're willing to make these sacrifices in order to advocate for. So really in closing, what is it about Framingham? Sure. Unlike some of the other candidates, perhaps all even, I am not a Framingham native. I chose to live here and I picked it out of many cities and, and towns across Massachusetts. I love the diversity. I love how easy it is to get around the state. I love the economic opportunities that we have. Um, my husband was able to change jobs to go work in Westboro and has the world's easiest commute now. Um, but mostly I love the people. Um, I've gotten in with a wonderful group of parents, um, all of whom who really truly care about their children. There's not any of that um, stereotypical mom sniping that, that you see on TV. Um, everybody truly cares and helps one another in this community. Um, it's actually one of the things I love about the crazy message boards in Framingham is that everyone cares so deeply and that they're making such strong arguments on, on either side and that we can all come together on, on certain things. Uh, people with whom I disagree on other issues you know, in the school lunch conversation absolutely agreed with me that every child needs to be fed. And I think that we can find that common ground. I was even um, speaking with a woman on the doors who is not a fan of people who are Democrats um, mm -hmm. and is a big fan of the President of the United States, but we were able to find some common ground in that conversation mm -hmm. as well. And I think that's what gr is great about Framingham, is that we are able to be a true community here and accept all sorts of people from all kinds of backgrounds. 
So for folks listening at home, if they want to get more involved or learn more about you, how can they do that? Sure. Uh, check out my website, which is votemariarobinson.com. Or if you really want, we even took up votemrsrobinson.com just to lean into the joke. Um, and so we'd love to have people come out, volunteer, or if you want to meet me, I am around 617-600-8325. Wonderful. And so your election is September 4th, the primary, and it's... A little different. Uh, Just a smidge. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to try to explain it, and if I get it wrong, correct me. Sure. So September 4th, if you're interested in voting for Maria or one of the other candidates, you go to, go to your polling place, and you ask for a ballot. Uh, and the ballot you're given is not going to have any names written for a state representative. Correct. What you'll need to do is fill in the oval uh, next to the option to do a write-in, mm -hmm. fill in that oval, and then write the name. So in your case, Maria Robinson. Correct. Uh, when you go for the primary, as every primary, you're running as a Democrat mm -hmm. on the Democratic primary, or in the Democratic primary. So Democrats and folks who are not a part of a party, who are unenrolled or <coughs> consider themselves independent, can ask for a Democratic ballot and write your name in. Uh, and then whoever of the candidates running wins that Democratic primary, whoever has the most write-ins, uh, will then go on to November 6th. Uh, did I get it that mostly is, right? That is right. Excellent. Uh, mostly done. And so wherever you voted before is the same place you vote this time. Uh, and the big difference, though, is that you'll need to go into the polling place knowing not only who you're going to vote for, but remembering that you need to fill in the oval next to the word write in and then actually write in. A candidate's name. Yes, and using your best penmanship. <laughs> Excellent. And I'm wondering, I'm, I'm assuming we're not going to have quick results. Probably not. The Secretary of State is coming out in early August to have a conversation with us and with um, new acting city clerk Ferguson. So we'll, we'll know more after that, but uh, I assume it'll be either a very long night or a long couple of days. Well, excellent. Well, I want to thank you for what you're doing. I remember my first campaign two years ago. Uh, you're out late, you're knocking on doors, uh, you're investing all of your energy into this, and you're working towards this magical date that at one point seems like so far away, and now is just around the corner. So Maria, thank you so much for coming in. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you for everything you do for Framingham and for taking up the mantle while we are down a state representative. We appreciate it. It's a fun job. It's a really fun job. You get to be involved in as many different things as you want. Uh, and Chris did a fabulous job. And selfishly, I want to make sure that whoever continues that work uh, is the best candidate possible. And being able to interview all of you uh, is one way I'm hoping to, to ensure that. So thank you so much. For those watching at home, I am interviewing all the candidates that are currently running for this seat. Uh, they're all participating in this write-in on September 4th. And so if you want to learn more about Maria, please do that. Uh, but also tune in and watch the other interviews as well. Until next time, thank you.